Ladies and gentlemen, this is Adam Kokos here in San Francisco, California, and I'm here with Chandra Dugirala of Tides Network. And what they are doing with blockchain-based health insurance is just mind-blowing already at this point. Now, I have to say, before we get into to explaining this, it, it, it's one of those things you want to go, well, blockchain, it's going to be able to do everything. But, you know, health insurance, what, health and how are, how are going to, and, and I, th there's something about me as someone who's an enthusiast of, of Bitcoin and blockchain technology that goes, yeah, yeah, of, of course, we've got to be able to do health insurance on, a, there's got to be some way to get that on a blockchain, there's got to be some way that, that we can do that better in a decentralized manner than, than what we have today with this government corporatist banking system favoring model that is so corrupt and, and so destructive and so anti-health in so many ways. But then I go, all right, health insurance on the blockchain. Uh, how does this actually work? So, Chandra, if you could first, uh, before we get into the nuts and bolts of this, start by, you know, how did you get involved with this and, and what's your relevant background? All right. Thanks for having me, Adam. Um, Thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, so my background, I'm a doctor by training and I've been a serial entrepreneur. I started a medical device company, a digital health company, and I've been uh, like you, uh, a libertarian and a Bitcoin enthusiast for a long time. And as you learn the uh, decentralized network, distributed systems, you know, one of the greatest applications is currency, which Bitcoin is doing. But there are a lot of other applications that you could do to decentralize, centralized systems that have uh, many problems, including censorship, including, you know, arbitrariness of the rules and arbitrariness of enforcement, you know, uh, regulatory overload, all sorts of corruption at many levels. So these things can be tackled from a decentralized uh, network perspective. And well, that's... Well, I want to go back. You started as a doctor before getting into, into anything with blockchain. Well, where did you study and, and, and what did you practice? So I went to medical school in India, then I was here briefly for a PhD program in biophysics and uh, uh, I spent three years there and then I went back to clinical training because I thought that was more in line with my uh, interests in actually doing things that move the needle. Um, so I trained in internal medicine, I moved to California and then I started uh, working on my first startup which was the medical device company. So the dream has always been to innovate uh, and create something new in either healthcare, uh, core, medical sciences like medical devices, biotech, or uh, somewhere around where technology melds with healthcare and medicine, you know, whether it be digital health, whether it be uh, this Tides Health Insurance Network, or uh, intersection of technology and healthcare has been my passion. And so, what was the impetus that got you to shift from medical devices to health insurance? A uh, couple of things. One, uh, there is, and this was the time when medical device industry was facing a lot of headwinds. One of them was the, uh, uh, we were just coming out of the financial crisis of 2007-2008. Uh, number two was the uh, regulations that were accompanying uh, Obamacare, like the 2% tax on revenues for medical device companies that pr practically killed off a lot of uh, venture capital investment into medical devices because not only do the VCs have to take the risk, uh, you know, take the market risk, take the uh, clinical risk, the technology or scientific risk, but now they also have to pay the government for the privilege of investing in these high-risk uh, innovative startups. So that you, mean, you mean pay the government more than the general tax regulatory burden on the rest of the economy? Exactly, a 2% tax on revenues for experimental stage, early stage companies that don't have any profits for a long time is, is very onerous. And, and, and not just that, there's other uh, issues like uh, unpredictability from uh, an FDA uh, approval regulatory pathway, that was another big deal. So a lot happened uh, during that time frame and I don't think the medical device industry has come back yet. However, there was a lot of consolidation and Regulatory overload typically favors the incumbents and the asymmetry of incentives, which uh, they obviously like and encourage uh, more regulation because it works in the favor of the incumbent. Well, let me just point out here that this is something that really brings it home in terms of the impact of government burden and that when you had Obamacare, 2% tax increase on medical devices, 
there were a lot of medical devices that never came to market, that never got developed, that never saw the light of day because they were made economically unfeasible in the R&D phase. Now, you might think this is just some like minor thing to worry about, but when you look at the FDA, and we just spoke to Dr. Mary Ruert last week in Texas, and she points out with her research that the FDA is responsible for tens of millions of deaths conservatively from letting unsafe drugs on the market, keeping safe drugs and safe devices off the market, which is you know another hurdle that they have to clear. But you know, Chandra, I'm I'm optimistic now because when I see this disruptive government overreach that is so blatant, as you saw with Obamacare, as you point out with the device tax. And, th and this led to you getting to blockchain-based insurance, and obviously you still got to make that connection for us. But before we get to that, do you think there were any other things that came out of Obamacare, that came out of recent bigger trends in the healthcare industry that are, are setting you up for success with Tides Network? Absolutely, yes. Uh, one of the things that uh, the ACA, or Obamacare as it's called, did was to mandate uh, that individuals purchase health insurance. And there is a threshold of what kind of insurance you need to purchase. For example, let's say you're a young person, you're just coming out of school or college and you're working two jobs, you're starting to work at McDonald's, you want to learn your skills and, and climb up the ladder in life. You're forced to purchase a comprehensive insurance with all sorts of benefits that you'd never use. And that makes it economically burdensome. Uh, the market, on the other hand, would address that issue with a flexible, uh, you know, plan. Like, you know, you'll have a variety of plans to choose from based on whatever your individual needs are. For example, you could say, hey, I'm good. I am a young and healthy guy and I take good care of myself. And the only cost that I really need to insure against, because insurance, remember, is uh, a fallback against unforeseen uh, adverse events. It's not for expected health care. And you could say, I'll pay my uh, expected health care cost, which is probably once or twice a year uh, visit to the primary care doctor. Uh, out of my pocket, and then I will pay really cheap catastrophic insurance to cover uh, unforeseen adverse events or catastrophic events, and then I'll be able to save a lot of money and invest in other things, like my education or my career or whatever. Uh, you don't have that option with uh, this individual mandate. Uh, the reasons for the individual mandate is a different discussion, but it did impact a lot of other people, a lot of people, especially young people, uh, coming right out of college and starting on their careers very adversely. The thing that happened is that the individual mandate has now been repealed in the tax uh, uh, reform law that was passed this year. And that will be effective starting January 2019. So you will see a lot more flexible insurance products uh, that are more responsive to consumers' needs and desires come out. And uh, Tides will be at the forefront of that. So. All right, well, that brings us back to your current project with Tides. What got you started on this? What helped you see the potential for a blockchain-based decentralized health insurance network. Right, so uh, as I was learning more and more about Bitcoin, because um, when we talk about cryptocurrencies or tokens, Bitcoin has to be the mother of them all, and it is. Uh, that's what started this this second revolution in distributed systems. And uh, as you learn how- You're calling the internet the first. Um, not really. Distributed systems, there's a lot of research since the 1980s, uh, and it was mostly confined to a pessimistic view of things. From my understanding is that there, is a, there are problems with implementing distributed systems, and there's this thing called the Byzantine Generalist Problem, and most of the literature on this is that, oh, this is impossible, that is impossible, uh, uh, a really negative view of looking at implementing these things. But Bitcoin found a very specific solution to the uh, Byzantine generals problem using uh, uh, intelligent, you know. Uh, the in blockchain in itself, is it? Well, so well, what, what is the first revolution in decentralized technology then? Well, I don't, I don't, I don't claim to call it uh, a revolution, but the development from the 80s to 2009, you could call it phase one. Okay. But phase two, after the development of blockchain, the, uh, the mining algorithm, and, and putting the, 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 the comprehensive the system that was, oh, yeah. that was Bitcoin, yeah. finally, as a, as right. a, as a complete, neat package. Like, yeah, blockchain as a major innovation, the uh, consensus protocol that borrows from Hashcash, the, the Nakamoto consensus, as we call it, that's one. And then the incentives that are engineered to uh, distribute or disperse the power between the users, the miners, and the protocol developers. 
And that is actually the primer for most of these things that follow, whether it be Ethereum or uh, any of its, you know, uh, contenders or challengers. Yeah, Bitcoin serves as the inspiration. So how does that get us to Tide's network? So uh, when you look at the blockchain, it's interesting from a technical perspective, but from a macroeconomic perspective, it is really, really interesting in the sense that the blockchain is a new way, a fundamentally different and a new way for coordinating economic activity, right? You have markets, which is spot markets, like for example, you know, everybody's trading with everybody else. And it scales, but it has a lot of problems because as the number of participants in a market, spot market grows, there's a combinatorial explosion where you have to interact with all the other participants in the market to get your price and to actually make that trading decision, right? That's a problem. So there are centralized exchanges that solve that problem. The uh, other way of market coordination is a firm, right? You could consider a firm as a nexus of contracts bound, uh, uh, you know, that's the outer boundary of a firm, and the firm acts as an island where economic activity happens very efficiently within the firm. And then market, spot market activity uh, act, uh, uh, happens outside of the firm. So the blockchain f is fundamentally different from those two uh, ways of coordinating your uh, economic activity, which is now everybody uh, can transact with everybody else without knowing who they are, uh, without knowing anything about them because they're running the node and you're running the node, you can independently verify all of the transactions yourself. And uh, the system is designed in such a way with these cryptographic primitives that it is almost ungameable without expending enormous amount of resources. So that allows anybody, like for example, Adam doesn't know a guy in uh, North Africa somewhere. You don't need to know who it is. You don't need to know anything about that person. You can accept payments from him. You can send payments to him. And that's what these trustless or trust disintermediated networks uh, allow you to do. So you take that paradigm and then look at uh, any function like insurance where there's a bunch of people on one side, right? Fundamentally, when you break down insurance into its constituent parts, it is a group of people have a lot of tail risks, right? Uh, you might have a stroke, you might get hit by a car, that's the tail risk that you want to guard against. However, it's super capital inefficient for you to set aside the capital to make you whole if that happens. For each one of you to do it is very inefficient. But if you know the class probability of the event with a certain degree of, 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 of confidence, you could say, we're going to come together, form a risk pool, pay premiums, meaning the price of risk plus the cost of sharing risk, into this pool or this pot. And when one of us has this adverse event, it's going to make us whole again. Right. Well, hold on. Just to be clear, I thought it was brilliant messaging for this to be able to talk about tide pools. That sounds brilliant, but you can't say tide pods anymore. That's <laughs> like that's a trigger word for most people at this point. That is unfortunate, uh, but uh, you know, thankfully we didn't choose tide pods before that that whole uh, phenomenon caught on. What is, what is the Tide Network going to be doing about this Tide Pods problem? Are you going to be able to use the blockchain to solve the problem of teenagers eating laundry detergent? No, that's, I think some things are beyond even the blockchain. Actually not. Parents can insure against their kids eating the Tide Pods. So there you go. As a specific event with a certain pr known probability of risk within the Tide Network. All right. You want to insure against your kids eating Tide Pods if you're, if you're passing on some dumb genes. You might want some smarter health insurance. <laughs> that's funny. So, so that's the fundamental uh, function of insurance. The insurance company is just the intermediary that facilitates this risk pool formation, right? They create the risk pools, they take the premiums, and then they promise to pay you when something happens to you, right? But the problem there is the insurance company as an entity has three ways it makes money. You pay premiums, that's their revenue. Right. They pay your expenses out, that's their expense. And then they can make money off of the float by investing it wisely. But you know, you could assume safely that making money off of the float is never going to be above market or the long term because you know you can't expect these insurance companies to have uh, supermarket returns over long periods of time. So, so you, have a, you have a you have a you have a weaker incentive to you you have an incentive to not pay people exactly. out. Your your the way you increase your revenues is overprice the risk. The way, you, the way you reduce your expenses is to deny, delay, and defer their claims, and which is what the insurance companies do. And, now you and can then we have a huge whole other set of economic inefficiencies of people disputing insurance claims and waiting for payments and suffering as a result of that. 
Exactly, because the insurance company, like I said, makes money off the float, and the float comes from the money that they don't pay as claims. The longer they keep the money, the more money they make off the float. All right, well, well let's start with the, the, the tied network version of this, where you don't have that central authority. I mean, there, I, and part of me goes, well, there has to be some central authority. I mean, there has to be a main website. There has to be a host for the system. There has to be uh, a white paper and, and at least an agreed upon protocol. So when people are paying in or right now earning uh, the, the tied tokens, how does that work? Who's actually handling that? What is this central entity? What is its actual right, so role? Uh, in the case of Tides, Tides is the protocol, meaning it's a set of rules and principles that everybody who runs uh, the system has to follow. Uh, in Tides, people can create their own pools, like for example, Adam Kokesh can create Adam Pool. He could be the pool administrator. He could band together a thousand people and say, hey, these are the rules. I'm going to take like 1% or 2% off of the uh, surplus pro as profit for the effort of running this pool. Oh, hold on. So just to be clear, is, is it almost more accurate to say that Tides Network is a platform mm -hmm. for insurance providers rather than an insurance provider itself? Yes. Tides is not a carrier. It allows anybody to create uh, an insurance product for its own pool. And you could do that because the infrastructure is all built out. So you, Tides Network basically is, uh, has these elements, right? One. On the one side, you have people coming together to farm pools, but the network comes with all of the critical functions of an insurance company, like actuarial competency, uh, underwriting ability, uh, claims process, uh, processing and adjustment. Those are all built into Tides in a decentralized network. Well, and that gets, that gets to the next thing that, that, that to me is the, the logistical challenge here. So if, if I were to set up my own pool on the network, and like it was just for, say, my community in Arizona, Juniperwood Ranch, where we have, uh, you know, everybody lives outside and is, is active and healthy and takes care of themselves, but we have specific risks that, that we want to insure for. Um, do, do I then have the responsibility of adjudicating claims as the no. administrator? So uh, you could commission an actuary to set the premium risk uh, price for you, the, or price the premiums for you. You can have an underwriter uh, underwrite the policy. And once you have these members, the claims adjustment process is done by a well, distributor. Well, so just to be clear, those, those would be other independent operators who are operating as independent agents filling these specific functions on the Tides network. Yes. We don't hire them. We don't pay them. They're not employees. Uh, these are independent agents that are incentivized to perform their actuarial or underwriting or claims processing work, and they're incentivized only to be honest and accurate and nothing else. So they don't have these quarterly financial pressures coming down from the CEO of the insurance company. They're independent contractors. They actually get paid more if they're more accurate and are more efficient. That's it. So for the launch of this, are, are you, uh, there, there's, this is, it's not like, hey, we got a huge loan from the bank and we're taking people on and we're open for business. You, you have to sort of soft launch this, right? You have to slow launch it where you, you, you are launching a token later this year, correct? But you also have to get buy-in from people in order to make the, these network functions work, right? So you, you, you have to have so much better of a system to leapfrog what's being worked on right now by the insurance companies to try to adopt, uh, adapt to all these new realities, it has to be so much better that an individual is willing to say, I am going to now become an independent, independent actuary uh, or, or adjuster or a pool operator on Tides Network in order for the system to launch. Can you describe that, that process and, 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 and how it, it seems precarious, right? That if, if, if something gets screwed up at the beginning and you don't get that critical mass of buy-in, then you, you might be struggling for a long time before you get to that critical mass of momentum, that a, right? That is a very interesting point. And that's the right way to think about it. So this is a network, right? It's a multi-sided network with participants on, on like many sites. There's these you know, functionaries, which is actuaries, underwriters, claims processors, there's people and then uh, you know, the pool operators who actually get them together to form the pool. So the way we're going about it is we have actuaries signing up on the network now. We actually have a carrier that is building the first product on top of Tides. Because that's, remember, that's the, that is our customer, the pool operator or the carrier. Uh, 
Mm. They build on top of tights because it comes with a plug and play architecture where you can have the actuarial function done, you can have these claims processing function done, which I don't think we got to, but we can discuss. Uh, you don't have to worry about the third party uh, uh, claims adjustment process or uh, having to do your own claims adjustment administrative process. Because in Tides Network, once you're a member of the pool, you get uh, your identity, you go to a doctor, uh, the doctor who also happens to be a part of the network. Let's say you have a, uh, received a service. You sign that transaction using your private key. Uh, it has to be a valid signature, otherwise it wouldn't be picked up by the well, system. So just to be clear about the doctors under the actual medical service providers, any institution yes. can be registered with Tides Network in general, yes. and then any pool operator can use any medical provider and be able to shop around. So, I mean, right away there, you have a huge benefit that doesn't happen with m current hospitals and insurance companies where you, the patient is denied the ability to shop around. Yes. The insurance company doesn't bother to because of all the different convoluted interests. And here, at least, you have yeah, the independent the pool operator serving that market function of actually shopping around now, right? All pools will have access to all of the providers on the network. Uh, there is no artificial uh, preferred provider networks being enforced on tides, and we want it that way. We don't think the preferred provider metric or the ability to rank providers based on uh, what, how they uh, serve the insurance company's interests. That is not the right way to do it. You know, we are introduced. Remember. This is a complete peer-to-peer -peer pool. Even the pool administrator does not have a, a say on how much money gets returned back to the pool, except for his, his commission. All of the surplus money in the pool, uh, surplus from premium, surplus from money made off the float, all of that gets distributed back to the members at the end, right? So it is your money that you're spending. That introduces price sensitivity. People actually shop around. They care about the services that they're consuming. They care about the quality of services that they're getting. They care about the kind of providers they're getting these services from. So the second step in the claims process is the provider has to sign that same transaction with his signature, private key or an equivalent. And then that becomes a valid claim that is picked up by these oracles who don't know anything about you, don't know anything about the provider. They just check it against a canonical source of truth, which is, hey, how many people at this age group, et cetera, et cetera, in this location have gotten this procedure? What is the frequency? What is the average cost? And is this out of bounds or no? And then simple yes or no vote. And that is the Oracle consensus for determining an up or down vote, valid uh, for whether or not a claim needs to be paid or not. And, but earlier you alluded to what happens when someone disputes the claim resolution, right? So let's say Adam has a problem. He went to a doctor, had an x-ray, had uh, $5,000 paid. And the first round of consensus voting says, OK, this is out of bounds. We're going to deny this, right? but you actually got the service, you th thought that was a fair price for the service that you received, so you could appeal it. There's a small fee for appeal. And in the next round, 2n minus 1, meaning an odd number of people from the Oracle network are going to be selected, um, and there is no overlap between the people who voted in the first round versus the second round, and then they pick up the claim and do the same process. And you can increasingly keep appealing these until you reach a point where you, uh, you're fairly certain that the claim is actually not valid, and then you give up. Or the last round that reverses all of the voting up to that round gets to, uh, approves your claim, and then you're happy. Okay, so you're launching a token later this year, and of course with ICO fever sweeping the crypto community, I, I think there's some legitimate excitement around a project like this where you're launching a new token where it is tied to, at least right now, an attempt to start a, a specific network, create an inherent network value with a specific function. It's not just a gimmick token, obviously. But how are you launching a token uh, sort of ahead of the network? And what is the point? Is this, are, is this like... So we're not launching the token ahead of the network. The tokens will be available only after the network is functional on testnet. And the function of the tokens is to actually coordinate all of these various actions. Well, let, me, let, me, let me be precise, because I, I wasn't referring to the, the, the functionality. Obviously, if you launch a token, you have to have a network on which it resides. You have to have that decentralization right. of, of the hosting of it. But you, don't yet ha you will not yet, at that point, have a functional health insurance network, right? Because it, it, it doesn't come until 
the system is populated and, and, and there are enough people buying in. So how, what is, so aside from being speculative, what is the value of that token and how does it transition from being something that you're offering as kind of an early investment to something that becomes functional on the network? And is it one of these things where if you, if you got in early, now you have your health insurance covered for life uh, and, and it's people kind of coming in afterwards that are, that are subsidizing that by increasing the value of the token? Uh, so we're not actually selling tokens. Uh, tokens are not for sale. So there is no ICO. Um, the tokens are going to be delivered. They're mineable by anybody by performing these functions in the network. If you're an actuary, you get to get more tokens. If you are an underwriter, you can perform work and get these tokens. If you are a claims processor, you can process claims and get these tokens. And there's a distribution schedule for tokens. Uh, it changes based on the network growth and, and the size. And the other important function these tokens do is they're staking tokens. Like if you are, uh, let's say, let's take the previous example that I gave you, the oracles that are voting on. What is to stop them from colluding or just being lazy and just voting up or down without checking anything? So they have to stake tokens. And the people who are on the wrong side of the consensus get to lose their tokens we, who, that get distributed to the, the oracles that are on the right side of the consensus. So it actually continuously disrupts cartelization and rewards the honest functioners. So that's the thing. And if, when you're talking about tokens being sold uh, to bootstrap networks, that's a whole different discussion. Uh, it's legally very complicated. That is not what we're doing. And, and sometimes legally, ethically questionable as well. Um, some of them, I'm, I'm sure, are ethically questionable because they don't have the intentions. But even if they had good intentions, the, uh, the legality of it is still open in this, uh, you know, uh, in this jurisdiction, in the US, where for example, if you sell tokens to people uh, and the reason they're buying the tokens is with the expectation of an appreciation in value, that becomes speculative and it becomes a security. So that's the, uh, so which is why we're not selling tokens. They're never be going to be sold in a public sale. We are raising funds through a Regulation D offering, which is for accredited investors only in the US. And the token delivery has its own mechanics there. It's very decentralized. Anybody can mine them. So how is the so if you're in, if you're investing through a, a class D funding process, are the investors getting paid in tokens? Is that part of their investment in the network? That equity or security, and the company is free to offer them uh, whatever our property is in the form of a dividend, like any company that sells equity is. So there is a company separate from the network that runs it, like. Steamit.com no. is on there the is Steam blockchain, like you have a Tides Network Corporation right. that is the administrator of the Tides Network blockchain. Tides Network is, uh, is a decentralized network. Tides Corporation, the company, is the one that actually initially builds it, implements it, gets it to uh, critical mass, bootstrap the network. Uh, but we have no control over how the network functions. We cannot arbitrarily change what the network does, what kind of pools get uh, uh, built up on the network, what kind of insurance products are offered, we have no control of that. And that's the intention. The cap table of the company will never have control over how the network functions. So is the only way to earn the tokens now by building into the network so it's tied to that growth inherently? Uh, yes, for the most part. For the most part, is there a way for an individual to earn tokens, or do you have to be providing some function in the health insurance network? Uh, you have to be. You could, for example, uh, be a member. You could be a pool administrator, and you, you could uh, sign up a lot of people to join your, your, uh, your pool. And that rewards you by staking more tokens on your behalf. And at the end, the surplus premiums, are, when they're distributed, you get your uh, tight tokens, right? So you're, per you're performing functions in the network. It's a multi-sided network. On the one side is demand for insurance services. So if you're actually getting and signing up these pools and building these insurance pools, you get rewarded with tokens. If you're an actuary who's performing ac uh, accurate, efficient actuarial work, you're going to be rewarded with tokens. If you're a claims processor that is voting honestly and efficiently on these claims, then you get rewarded with tokens. So we consider this performing work or functions in the network that are critical to the network to be able to get tokens a form of mining. Because mining is that's just, just performing work to be able to, mine, uh, to get the currency of the network. So if someone wants to buy into this, it's not going to be functional, uh, I mean, w at least until the end of the year, is that correct? Uh, that you'll have, uh, that you'll have yeah. like live on pools test? that people can sign up for? Right, on testnet it'll be live once in September. We have a carrier that is building the first pool, peer-to-peer uh, -peer health insurance product on Tides. It is geared towards specifically 
the uh, demographic that we just talked about, which is the young, healthy people who want catastrophic insurance, especially if they're not employed. So gig economy workers, self-employed people, that is the first product. And that we expect to be, so the network will be yeah, on testnet. That's the market that Obamacare blew up by, by shutting out of the health insurance mainstream in many ways, right? Yes, but uh, since the individual mandate is repealed, there will be a lot more uh, space in the market to create these innovative products that serve these different, different consumer needs. So for uh, the, the people who are investing later when it comes time to actually buy a health insurance plan, are, are we going to be buying in, in dollars to these, to these providers and, and yes. then th those dollars get essentially converted to Tides tokens and then they get used in a separate monetary system that exists within the health insurance network? That's a great question. So uh, the reason why we don't want people to buy Tides or pay their premiums with Tides is because you don't want to have the friction of a uh, token whose price is fluctuating and then you have your inability to calculate your insurance premiums. You can't calculate your costs. We, don't, we want to avoid that. You could pay your premiums in US dollars. Uh, the tokens coordinate everything that happens inside the network. On the other edge, we consider these the edges, right? You pay premiums in dollars the pool reserves will always be in dollars. Uh, when the term ends, the distribution happens in tides, people who are functioning in the network get rewarded in tides, and then the providers who provide the service of the doctors, they also get paid in US dollars, not in tokens or cryptocurrency. So the tokens act as the network currency inside, but the premium payments as well as the provider payments will be in US dollars. Well, this is really exciting. I mean, I, I, I didn't expect some of these innovations coming out of blockchain to be so near on the horizon. And I'm, I'm just really excited that someone is already working on this. That this is like, you, you know, when, when, when you go, shouldn't, shouldn't someone be doing that? Yeah, you're glad that there's people like this who are going, you know what, yeah, there's an opportunity here. There's a market opportunity. There's a technology opportunity. There's an entrepreneurial innovation opportunity here. So, Chandra, I, I just want to close by asking, what can people do to get involved in this point and accelerate the adoption of Tides Network and decentralized blockchain technology in general, but specifically with this project, what you're working on here? Uh, so, for Tides, if you are any of these following um, actuary, you have underwriting experience, if you are a claims processor who's worked with a health insurance company, you know how bad it is. So if you want to work for something that is transformative and it actually restores insurance to its societal function, which is to be the safety net versus being uh, a way for, you know, <laughs> corporations to collude with the government to extract economic rent or to do all of these, have captive markets and all of these things. Oh, come on, you, you can tell us how you really feel there. How, how do you really feel about the mainstream health insurance market, Chandra? Uh, well, this is a polite interview, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to be that, uh, that open. But, you know, we, well, we all know the problem. It's, it's a crime. I mean, let's, let, like, it, it, health insurance today is criminal. It's a series of frauds, rip-offs, and extortion rackets tied up into this one general thing to rip you off and play on your worst fears about that which matters most to you, your health. And that is really freaking sick. And it's time we render the system obsolete. I totally agree with you. Yeah. So I, I hope this can be a good recruiting video for anybody who can get involved in this, anybody who's interested in investing. But so I want you to please finish your answer. <laughs> um, so and if you have any specific insurance related ideas, complaints, problems that you've had, feel free to share with us. We have our Telegram channel. Uh, we're always listening to uh, customers. We would love to hear your feedback and any ideas, suggestions you have. We want to implement them. We, wanna, we want you to be engaged in the development of this platform from, from the ground up. It's not going to be, hey, we've developed this, we sold tokens to a bunch of people, and now buy them and use this or not. Um, it's going to be with everybody's participation, because this is like universal need insurance. We all want to have less uncertainty in our life, you know, have uh, the measure of, of assurance and peace of mind that, you know, when something bad happens, you have this fallback. So that's the uh, plug for Tides. But if you, could, if you want to get involved in the, the whole distributed, decentralized uh, movement, I think, and this is uh, an answer to a question you didn't ask, which is, why decentralization? I think the future is that all firms, all companies, all functions that have the semblance of a network, 
anything that has a buyer and a seller, the transactions taking place, and there's an intermediary. The blockchain is a technology of disintermediation. All of these centralized marketplaces, intermediaries, banks, insurance companies will be replaced by decentralized networks. And if that doesn't excite you, I don't know what will. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Chandra Dugirala, Tides.network. Thank you very much, sir. Excellent. Thank you to YouTube for hosting this video and for being an essential part of human progress by making video hosting available worldwide to everyone on the internet. However, the next phase in human progress is here with Steemit.com and their video hosting alternative blockchain-based solutions, including DTube. And you can find that through Steemit.com as well as my own page there, at Adam Kokesh. This is a decentralized blockchain-based social media network that pays you fairly for your content. Already, I'm regularly making more there with a single post than I do from an entire month on YouTube. So please join us on the next frontier of the information revolution at steamit.com. And if you want help getting a leg up there, I'm happy to re-steam your posts and make sure that no one is starting from scratch. Just email me one of your favorite posts at adam at thefreedomline.com and we'll share it on my feed.